Welcome to chapter 7, the acid-base relationship chapter. Uh, there is CO2 dissociation curve as well. Uh, the next presentation I'll go over that, the CO2 curve. Uh, this one's just going to be on your basics of acid and base relationship. So we'll do the CO2 curve in a different lecture and so be to uh, be ready for that but uh, this one I sort of decided to break it up a little bit so that way you're just focusing on sort of one thing at a time so the acid base relationship we're going to talk about um, how the body compensates for different types of conditions and the whole idea is to keep the pH in balance and what happens when the body's pH gets too high, too alkalotic, or too low, too acidotic, is the organ systems will start to dysfunction, and that can ultimately lead to death. So even in a severe alkalotic state or severe acidotic state, either way, your body can start to go into death, or your patient's body can start to go into death. So monitoring their pH status and how the body compensates and how we can help the body compensate is going going to be very, very important, especially if you're working in critical care medicine, whether it's in the neonatal ICU all the way through the pediatric ICU and adult ICU, even in home care patients and patients in our diagnostic lab uh, that are doing treadmill exercise studies and all those other things, we're going to be looking at the patient's pH. We have draw serial blood gases on athletes to look at when they go into lactic acidosis or when they hit their anaerobic threshold. Uh, same thing when we do do uh, critical care medicine, if we have a patient that's due in a severe sepsis that's in ARDS, we'll have to look at their acid-base balance and figure out uh, benefits and um, risks associated with trying to help correct the pH, or is the pH at a level that is acceptable to sustaining life, not optimal, but uh, to sustaining life so that way we don't destroy lung tissue. So this is going to be a very pivotal uh, PowerPoint on not only uh, what uh, normal blood gases are and also to look at how do we label a blood gas. That's going to be important too, especially when you get into practice of medicine. So when you start to do this, you'll say, hey, the patient's in a complete acidosis, or the patient was in a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. What are the thoughts on making these changes on the ventilator? So these are all things that, that hopefully when you work through this and when we practice this, it will become a lot more uh, useful to you and it becomes a lot faster at knowing what's going on with the patient's uh, body than just saying their pH was this, their CO2 was this, their bicarb was this, they were on oxygen, right? So instead of saying all that, I say, hey, they were in a partially compensated metabolic acidosis. And so that tells the whole rest of the care team, oh, okay, so that makes sense why you made the move you made. So that's going to be important. So that way you too will understand the language of the hospital. It helps communicate the patient situation uh, more efficiently. And so that's why the naming of the blood gases will come into play here. So let's go ahead and get started. But when you're going to look at this, we're going to look at a lot of stuff that you probably looked at a little bit in chemistry class. Electrolytes, right, the charged ions, and the big one that we're going to be looking at here is the hydrogen ion. So remember, hydrogen ions are a strong acid. And this is something that we're going to look at. We looked at with the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, but we're going to look at that here. A weak acid usually disassociates uh, into partially into ions. And so uh, when we're looking at a lot of this, we're looking at taking a strong acid and turning it into a weak acid with one of our buffering systems. Uh, a strong base will disassociate uh, completely, but a weak base uh, reacts with the hydroxyls in the water and it it only has partial disassociation. So we're going to play with a little bit of chemistry in here. Don't let that be a mental block to you. It's going to be applied chemistry to what we're doing. And one of the big equations that we're going to look at here is going to be the henderson hasselbach equation. And that's going to pretty much be able to let us calculate what the pH is of our patient. And you're like, Derek, why would this be useful to me? Well, stay tuned and you'll find out. So let's get started. 
All right, so acids and bases. The body tries to uh, maintain a normal homeostasis. And this is the big thing here, is we try to keep that normal uh, environment of the red blood cell and the, in the blood vascular space as well as in our tissues. We need to keep that homeostasis because this is what regulates the function of all of the cells of our bodies. So if this is out of homeostasis, if it's out out of its normal environment then that's when things can become disorganized and that's when your body can start to shut down in certain places so this is all about getting the patient to a homeostasis that's either survivable or back to where their baseline homeostasis was why do I say back to where their baseline was well remember we have people that have different lung disease let's say emphysema at baseline, you guys now know enough that of what I've told you about emphysema that these patients have a hard time breathing all the time, right? They have dyspnea at rest, right? They, they continually feel short of breath. Their ability to exchange gas is very poor because they lost a lot of surface area in their lungs. And so they usually have to wear some oxygen to compensate for less surface area. Well, Normally, because there's less surface area, their ability to get oxygen into their bloodstream is very poor, and their ability to get CO2 out of the bloodstream is also poor. So not only do they have to wear oxygen, but also their pH on average is going to be a little bit lower than someone that does not have lung disease. They're going to be a little bit more hypercarbic and their pH is going to be a little bit lower. Now, we're not talking about having a pH of 7.0 here. We're talking about having a pH of 7.35, right? We're talking about having just a lower pH, still within normal limits, but lower than your normal 7.40. So when we have a patient like that on mechanical ventilation or a patient like that that's super sick, we want to take them back to their normal. So instead of... Uh, shooting instead of um, aiming for a pH of 7.40 with our breathing machines and targeting a specific pH that's perfect for someone that doesn't have lung disease we're going to take into account that this patient has lung disease and their baseline pH is lower and we're going to let them be a little bit more hypercarbic we're going to let them be a little bit more acidic like I said to their baseline and that will be what's most beneficial for them because they've developed a whole new body homeostasis right their body is chronically hypercarbic their body is chronically compensating for higher co2 levels and so we have to comp we have to understand we need to target that patient's baseline healthy condition not what is perfect in the perfect world for someone that has no lung disease and that's a big concept to get on so the whole thing here is we're looking at acids and bases and returning our patient to their homeostasis so if they don't have lung disease then we go by the perfect values. But if they are not perfect, their values are not perfect at baseline, and then we're going to account for that. So the acid and base balance, we're going to use acid and bases within the body to help compensate for this. When you have cellular metabolism, we're consuming nutrients like glucose, blood sugar, and oxygen, and we're going to produce acid like CO2. Remember, CO2 is a carbonic acid and so that co2 gets produced so that metabolic substrate that that the the results of co uh, metabolism that co2 should be prevented from being accumulated in the body because what happens if co2 accumulates in your body it becomes more acidic remember we're adding a, an acid to a solution so if i were to give you a beaker i know i sound very science class here and this beaker has a ph of 7.4 so we'll say that's perfect for a human so remember neutral is technically 7.0 but we're talking about humans in this specific context so uh, i give you a beaker solution and the ph within that beaker is 7.40 and i say okay now i'm gonna pump a bunch of co2 gas 
into that solution, well, you know, CO2 dissolves readily in fluids, right? It's going to be uh, in there. What's going to happen to the pH of that fluid in that beaker? If I put a bunch of carbonic acid in there, well, it's going to turn that pH of that beaker more acidic. So when I do add that CO2, it's going to then, hey, come down to, let's just say it comes down to a 7.0 zero pH now. So it got a lot more acidic with that adding of CO2. So we have to be able to get rid of CO2 and that's why the CO2 uh, dissociation curve will also be important to look at when we look at that as well. Uh, we can't function in this acidic soup right in this sort of murky acidic gross soup that happens our body's function will start to shut down and that's what we'll see especially in patients that have a ph less than 7.25 or in most patients ph less than 7.20 their body will start to shut down so if you see a ph of 7.0 uh, it's very rare that you will not see other organs being involved and in shut down at that area uh, so the body's ability to work outside of this normal pH balance is going to be very poor. And that's why, hey, the best thing out there to look at how your patient's functioning, where their homeostasis is, is an arterial blood gas. That's us. That's you going in and poking their artery and drawing some blood off of their artery. Usually it's the radial artery. Uh, and we try to look at their pH balance. And so based upon where their pH is, based upon where their CO2 level is, based upon where their bicarb level is, based upon where their pressure of oxygen, right, their P little AO2 is, based upon where their saturation of oxygen is, all gets evaluated on that blood gas. And based upon those results that you are drawing, right, as the respiratory therapist, we're going to make clinical decisions and adjust life support machines based upon that blood gas. So this is where the arterial blood gas is still, as we're recording this, is still the benchmark. This is the hallmark way to evaluate the effectiveness of our therapies and of a patient's acid-base balance. So arterial blood gas, it's arterial blood, so blood that hasn't had its oxygen used up. It's blood that hasn't had um, CO2 added to it from the tissues yet. So it's blood fresh from the lungs, so to speak, right? So we want to see how effective the patient is at ventilating and oxygenating with an arterial blood gas. So this is gonna help us see if our patient has an oxygen problem, a ventilation problem, and if so, how severe is it? Because if it's severe enough, what will happen to the pH? Well, the pH will start to change if it's severe enough. And then what will happen to their saturation, so on and so forth. So the arterial blood gas is going to be your hallmark test that most uh, respiratory therapists and most hospitals do to evaluate a patient's acid-base balance, their ability to ventilate, their ability to oxygenate, right? So this is going to be the hallmark test. So say no to acidic soups, they're gross, they're yucky. And that's what most of the issue we have in critical care medicine is dealing with patients that have a very low pH. Now remember, the pH is considered a negative logarithmic or logarithm scale, right? So that means the lower the number, the more acidic it is. I'll repeat that again, the lower the pH number, the more acidic it is, right? So it's sort of like golf, the lower the number, the better player they are, right? So the, here, the lower the number, the more acidic the patient is. And most of our patients, they have an inability or something stopping them from having good ventilation and good oxygenation. And so when both of those stop or one of them stops, that's when we see carbonic acid build up in their system and their pH will start to become acidic. So you will be dealing most of the time with an acidosis or patients that are threatening to go into an acidosis. So uh, remember the blood's uh, pH and I will, you will absolutely have to remember the normal values for arterial and venous, right? 
uh, when we're going through this uh, next section. Uh, it's very important. This is something you will use every day if you work in critical care medicine or emergency medicine. Most respiratory therapists that work in the hospital have to deal with these values daily. So this will be critical, right? We talked about Posey's law and calculating it, how we may not calculate that. It's more of a concept thing daily, right? We understand the concept. However, this is something you will use daily if you choose to practice in a lot of areas of respiratory therapy. So get ready to make sure you memorize these values. So the blood has a pH and it's a very narrow pH range. A normal range for a human is 7.35 to 7.45. This is an arterial value. If we were to draw a sample uh, a blood gas sample from a central line or from a pulmonary um, uh, artery catheter, it, it would be 7.30 to 7.40. So you're only 0 0.05 off between arterial and venous. So remember that a VBG, a venous blood gas, should be drawn from a central location, like a central line that that's sort of has that tip of it in the uh, superior vena cava, or it should be from a pulmonary artery catheter, one that's that where the distal tip is in the pulmonary artery. So we're not going to draw off of a hand IV or off of an antecubital or off of a leg vein. We're going to draw off of a central line. So if you are asked to get a venous blood gas, which we do as well, uh, it's going to be drawn off the central line as close to the heart as you can get. Okay. You do need to remember both of these. I will tell you in pediatric ICU, uh, we did a lot of venous blood gas values because most of the time their saturations and pressures weren't as big of a thing as their pH that we were looking at on the patient. So with pediatric patients, we tended to look more at the pH than the other values. So the venous blood gas was perfectly fine. Plus, how often do you want to go stab a kid's artery, right? Compared to a central line that's already in place that requires no needles or anything like that. Um, so usually we tended to go off the venous values. Um, so just a little side note there. So make sure you know both arterial and venous values. They will come into play. It, you will thank me later, right? Quote me, you will thank me later for having you have these values down. Um, so if the arterial pH is greater than 7.45, this is an alkalosis or an alkalemia. Emia is blood, right? It means the blood is alkalotic. Uh, some people call this basic. This blood is basic, right? You have it, a lot of base uh, going on. So the blood has a lot of bicarb, right? Uh, bicarb is a base. The bicarbonate ion there. Remember, it's an anion, and hydrogen is a cation. Um, so bicarb is a base. If a patient was severely acidotic, right? So if I had this beaker, so up here I'm going to draw a beaker, and I have a solution in here. And let's say the pH of that beaker was 7.0. Okay, not good for a human. Okay, so then I ask you, what can I do to make this solution, right? What can I do to make what's in this beaker more towards a normal pH? You say, hey, if I add some bicarb to that solution, right, then I can easily change the pH. And that's what happens here. If a patient has a severely low pH, one of our solutions for a patient that has a very, very low pH, now I'm not, I'm talking in this range, like a 7.0, uh, would be to give this patient some bicarb. And that's a medicine that we can give through their IV. Right? That's something we can give through their IV to help make their pH buffer to get closer to a 7.40 or to closer to a survivable pH. So if you have an alkalosis, that usually means you have a lot of base going on or you've lost a lot of acid. What do I mean by that? Okay, I'm glad you asked, hypothetically. Okay, so let's say I have a pH of 7.5. 
All right, that's alkalotic. And once we get into a pH of 7.5, I know it's a very narrow range, but once you get into pHs of 7.5, that's a range where people can start to go into seizures and have different things go on with them. So this can be a very serious issue too. So if I have a pH of 7.5, one of two things happened, okay? And this is where we'll get into the uh, gap versus non-gap acidosis or gap versus non-gap right so one of two things happen either i did something where i gave them an iv of bicarb and dumped a ton of bicarb hco3 minus i gave them a ton of bicarb right that is one thing that could have happened i could have accidentally instead of giving saline to this patient i could have given bicarb to this patient and altered their ph to be that level so i either gave them a ton of bicarb or right so let me open up your mind a little bit here pretend this didn't happen i did not give them bicarb but i still have a ph of 7.5 but what happened here is the patient got rid of hydrogen ions so the solution somehow got rid of hydrogen ions so let's say someone has massive vomiting right and I'm, I'm not I'm not making this up right if you have a patient that just vomits 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 what's in their stomach is it stomach acid or stomach base <laughs> stomach acid right HCl so when you're looking at this your stomach acid you're losing 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 so this patient that just is non-stop vomiting over here what's happening to their ph if they're losing an acid the ph of the blood is becoming more basic right we're getting rid of an acid so therefore what's left over is going to have a greater ratio of base to acid because we lost the acid so I just want to open up your mind where when we're looking at a patient clinically and we see a pH of 7.0 or we see a pH of 7.5, you need to think critically here and think, were they losing an acid, right? If you have the patient of 7.5, were they losing an acid or did we give them a base, right? Do we give them something that was a base? Or in the patient over here that has a 7, pH of 7.0, did we add an acid? right did the patient go into um, hypoxemia and go to metabolic acidosis right do we add an acid to the solution or here's where it gets funny and i'm not making this up right this can actually do it or did they have something like uh massive diarrhea Diar uh poop is basic right so if they had a massive amount of diarrhea and they lost a ton of uh gi uh material uh that's losing a lot of base that's losing a lot of bicarb so in that patient that has a severe acidosis is it something where their body created an acid and made the ph of 7.0 or is it something where their body actually got rid of a base and made it a 7.0 so i'm just trying to open you guys up to the critical thought process that you will need for critical care medicine okay so just because you see a ph that's acidotic or a ph that's alkalotic you need to think critically and be like okay chemistry to make a solution acidic I can either add an acid or I can get rid of a base. Chemistry, if I have a solution, I have a beaker that's 7.5, it, it got to 7.5 because I either added a base or I got rid of an acid, right? So I want you to open up your mind there to think, was this patient having massive vomiting? Was this patient having diarrhea, right? Was there something like this going on that can cause that acid-base balance to shift and that can help you focus on a solution, okay? So I know this is a lot. That's why you can always rewind this, watch it again. But think about that whole beaker, right? How did it get to that pH of 7.0? How did it get to that pH of 7.5? So when you have that patient in front of you and they have a pH of 7.5, hey, either we gave them too much bicarb, which will be pretty easy to know because their, their CO2 levels will actually be up. That's because the uh, bicarb is what's produced with, with um, 
uh, what CO2 is produced because that's the product of giving bicarb. Um, or we can see if their body got rid of an acid, right? So this is something like vomiting, like they were massively throwing up. Um, or we could look at the pH of their urine, things like that. So uh, seven, greater than 7.45 is considered alkalotic, alkalemic, or basic. Uh, if an arterial pH is less than 7.35, it's called an acidosis or an acidemia. Uh, in this case, an acidosis means we have a lot of hydrogen ions going on. And so that's what we'll be looking at, um, at a lot here. So... Uh, there are three ways that we usually buffer the acids and bases in our body. All right, so there's three ways. The chemical buffer system acts immediately. It's already what's in your bloodstream. It takes it from being a strong acid to a weak acid, right? So it only partially disassociates, right? So this is good. Instead of a strong acid, it's going to help buffer that pH to a weaker acid that your body can then not have near as much pH change to. So if you were to go outside and do wind sprints for 20 minutes, you're going to go into a little bit of an acidosis, but your chemical buffer system is what kicked in and helped you do that. Probably if you're running wind sprints too, your respiratory system also kicked in there. If you're breathing heavy, right, your respiratory system also kicked in to help correct that. But immediately, right away, as you start, before you start breathing hard in your wind sprints, your chemical buffer system was already at work. So this is sort of the order of operations that your body will use to buffer the acids and bases. Okay, the first thing, and it's going on right now in your bloodstream as you're falling asleep listening to my voice, is the chemical buffer system. That's going on continually, okay? And we'll talk about that next. This is just a summary screen, or a previous screen, I should say. The, then the next system that's more powerful is your respiratory system. Yay! The bad thing, the good thing about this is it's it's very it's much more effective than your chemical buffer system the bad part about this being a compensatory system right is that if you're in an acidosis and you're trying to get rid of co2 that's going to mean you're going to breathe fast and deep <sighs> just like you just ran a bunch of wind sprints in a row you're going to breathe really hard you're going to breathe fast and deep what do you know about the, the, the muscle, the diaphragm? What do you know about the accessory muscles? Are they smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, or skeletal muscle? Right? They're all skeletal muscle. Right? Your diaphragm, your external intercostals, right? Those are all skeletal muscles. And so if you were to do this for a day, uh, a day or days on end, these muscles can start to go into fatigue depending on how strong these muscles are. These muscles can go into fatigue just like your leg muscles from running wind sprints. They also can go into fatigue and fail. So that's where we have patients that come into the hospital and you will be dealing with this. So get ready for this, this one a lot. A patient caught pneumonia, right? They developed a pneumonia and sure enough, they've been working hard to breathe because of the pneumonia and it overloaded their respiratory muscles to now they're in respiratory fatigue. So you draw an, a blood gas on this patient and their CO2 level is high because their respiratory system can no longer compensate for the acidosis that their body is in. So their CO2 level is high because they're in respiratory fatigue, they're in respiratory failure, right? That's usually when we go ahead and put them on a machine to augment their breathing, right? A ventilator or a non-invasive ventilator. So the second most powerful system is the respiratory system, the most powerful buffering system. The most potent buffering system is going to be your renal. This is going to be your kidneys. Now, hopefully someone has very strong, well-functioning kidneys. That's a bonus here. But if they don't, let's say they're a chronic renal failure patient, their ability to compensate for the their acid-base balance is very, very poor. And that's why it 
it will behoove you, that's why it will help you to know uh, if a patient's kidneys are functioning well or not. I want to know what their kidney, their renal enzymes are. I want to know what their I's and O's are, right? How much input of fluids they're getting and how much output of fluids they're getting. I want to know if they're fluid positive or negative. I want to know how their kidneys are functioning because if their kidneys are starting to shut down, A, that's a sign of hypoxia, right? Uh, and B, that's also a going to hurt my ability to buffer the pH on my patient. That means we're going to have to look at other ways of helping to buffer this patient's pH. So the renal system is the most powerful out of, out of these three, but it can take a while, it can take a couple of days to kick in, even if the kidneys are functioning normally. So let's get started. The first one and the uh, the one that's on continuously, the most uh, the quickest one to go on is going to be the chemical buffer system. So this is what's floating around in your plasma uh, right now. So it has a lot of acid base combinations. Um, so the ones that we're going to look at here are going to be the carbonic acid bicarb buffer system, the phosphate buffer system, and the protein buffer system. So within this heading of the chemical buffer system, you have these three subheadings, right? These three things. These are the buffering pairs that's going on in your body right now, right? So when we're looking at this, it will take a strong acid like hydrochloric acid, uh, HCl. Uh, it's going to take a strong uh, strong acid to a weak acid. So when we're looking at this, it's going to have um, a reaction that takes it um, to where it's going to make the solution less potent. It's going to make it dilute the, the potency, if you will, to help the pH maintain a normal balance. So that's the non-chemistry way of looking at it. So one of the things, if you are into chemistry, if you take a strong acid like hydrochloric acid up here, if we take hydrochloric acid and we add um, sodium bicarb, so here, let me try to put this down here. So if we have hydrochloric acid and then we add it to sodium bicarb, so um, and a H C O three minus. All right. So if we add sodium bicarb, which is part of this, right? If we have sodium bicarb, it will produce, if we're looking at this, it will cause a reaction that will then send it to H two C O three. So um, when we're looking at this, it'll cause H2CO3, and that means it will also break down into sodium chloride, NaCl, right? So saline, right? So what we've done here is we've taken a strong acid and we've disassociated it to a weak acid, right? So that's what we've done here in this sodium bicarb. That's something you naturally have sodium and bicarb floating around into your, in your bloodstream right now. And so this is something that just takes a strong acid into a weak acid. So hopefully if you're a chemistry person, that sort of helped you out there a little bit looking at it. We can go into much more in depth there. However, I won't do it in this video. This is not that type of video. Um, so when we're doing this, right, and you see the example here, what it does, we have water. So this is one of the reasons why it's important for a patient to be adequately hydrated and why if a patient's dehydrated, we can actually see them in a severe acidosis. Well, we start to give that patient something like normal saline and it should actually help buffer their acidosis because not only are we rehydrating them but we're also helping them get the ability to buffer their acid as well so in the case of this if we have adequate water um, and we have a carbonic acid in the system it's going to create um, uh, h2 
CO3, and this should be a sub 2, uh, so carbonic acid. And so when this is broken up, it breaks up into the hydrogen ions and bicarb, right? And remember, this reaction can go uh, either way, uh, either way, right? And so if we give a patient a bunch of bicarb, right, it's going to combine with a hydrogen ion. So here's a situation. We give your patient bicarb because their pH is 7.0. And you're like, hey, Derek, I remember you saying, hey, bicarb could help with a patient that has a pH of 7.0 because it's a base, right? So you give this patient bicarb. Okay. You give this patient bicarb. The bicarb combines with the hydrogen ion, which is the acid, to make carbonic acid, H2CO3, right? So H2CO3 will then disassociate into CO2 and water. That's the product of this reaction going this way, okay? So this means, how do I know we gave someone a bunch of bicarb? Their exhaled level of CO2 or the CO2 level in their bloodstream, if we gave an increased amount, and this is part of the reason why you guys balance these chemical equations in pulmonary AMP, here, let's switch to purple. If I gave a patient a lot of bicarb, what will be the end results, right? For every action, there's an equal and opposing reaction. What will happen to the CO2 level in their bloodstream if I give someone a lot of bicarb? Well, if I give a lot of bicarb, remember balancing equations, their CO2 level will also be increased as well. So if we give a patient bicarb, it can actually increase the CO2 level in their bloodstream. Do you see that? So here's the question, and this is why we don't do it for just a light acidosis. So this is why a patient has to have a severe acidosis, less than 7.20 uh, before we give bicarb, is because if we give bicarb, it will create more CO2 in their bloodstream. When you give have more CO2 in the bloodstream, is there as much room on the hemoglobin molecule to carry oxygen? Is there, um, is there ability to carry oxygen to their tissues, increased or decreased? Carry, well, if the parking spaces are being taken up by an increased CO2 level on the hemoglobin molecule, then your ability to carry oxygen to your tissues then decreases. So the risk that you run when you do give bicarb on a patient with an acidosis would be to actually cause tissue hypoxia. I hope you sort of see that. So in critical care medicine, unless a patient has a severe pH like a 7.0 or 6.9, we usually do not give bicarb because it does have a, a, an effect, and you just went over it here, of increasing their CO2 levels. Well, let's say this patient is someone that has emphysema, and their baseline CO2 levels are really high, and their ability to get CO2 out of their bloodstream is very, very poor. This could actually push this patient over the limit into a, a more, more of an acidosis at the tissue level, and then cause them to get worse. So this is why this is not an all always fix. I hope you see that. Only in an emergent situation, like a severe pH, do we give it to help normalize it a little bit. We're not going to give enough to normalize it, but just to help a little bit, because we don't want too much CO2 being created. So it makes your pH look better, but ultimately what's going off the tissues is your CO2 at the tissues, your oxygen delivery to your tissues is worse, and the patient will ultimately, at the end of it, get worse altogether. So in critical care medicine, you'll see the sort of debate about bicarb. In bicarb, we're very cautious about giving it unless their pH is severe. I hope you sort of see that. All right, so you should know the three buffer systems that are within the chemical buffer system. Remember, um, they were on that screen there. Um, so hopefully you got that. And I remember talking in the opening screen here a little bit about the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is one of my favorite ones here. And I won't make you calculate it on the exam, uh, although I could. That would be awesome. But I won't. Uh, when we're looking at the Henderson-Hasselbalch, it's an equation that allows us to calculate someone's pH. 
And you're like, Derek, why would I need to know this? Why? What is the clinical application of the Henderson-Hasselbach equation? Uh, have you ever used it and why, right? What's, give me a scenario, give me an application point and that will help me see the importance of this. Okay, I'm glad you asked. You're thinking a lot like me there because I was like that. <laughs> so the cool thing about this allowing me to calculate the pH is if I draw a blood sample, an arterial blood gas on a patient, and I send it to the lab and I don't agree with the pH. So here's a situation, okay? I have a patient who has a pH of 7.40, all right? Their CO2 level is 70. Wow, that's a really high CO2 level. And then their bicarb level is five. So that's really, really low. So that's acidic. So if their bicarb level is acidic, their CO2 level is acidic, but their pH level is normal. Does that make sense? It does not make sense, right? There's no way that my pH would be normal if both my respiratory system was acidotic and my metabolic system was acidotic. There's no way my pH would be normal. So how do I know what the normal pH, how do I know that this is my patient's pH? Because remember, we make critical decisions based upon that patient's pH. So this looks terrible. So what I would do is I would actually calculate the Henderson-Hasselbach equation to figure out what their calculated pH is. Now odds are this could have been a lab error, right? This They could have run the gas and the machine itself put the pH at 7.40, the machine itself needs calibration. And so if we don't look at this critically as respiratory therapists and see, hey, that's acidotic, that's acidotic, that doesn't make sense why it's that way. So we need to be able to see the blood gas and see, hey, this doesn't make sense. Because otherwise, you could just leave this patient. You see the pH is 7.40, you're not thinking critically. You just say, hey, the pH is 7.40, let's not make any changes, everything looks fine. When in fact, is everything fine? <laughs> it is not, that patient is in very bad situation with a bicarb of five and a CO2 of 70. It's very, very bad and that's not life sustaining. So this is where I'm like, hey, I have used this because guess what? I've had this sort of very similar situation. High CO2, low um, bicarb, so that patient was in acidosis on both of those and I had a perfect pH. And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. So I calculated, I'm like, oh yeah, the pH should be like a 7.2 something, right? When I calculated it and I called the lab, I said, hey, can you guys rerun that on a different machine or recalibrate and rerun that gas on that machine? And so they did so, and sure enough, the machine was out of calibration. So this is something that may assist you in looking for calibration or look uh, in helping um, understand that that pH is either perfectly fine and it makes sense, or that pH is not fine and it could be a machine error. Because remember, your patient's life, <laughs> you as the as the expert in this area. Uh, will be the one that recognizes this and alerts the rest of the team to help make sure we get the most accurate data possible. All right, so the calculation here, it looks crazy. Does this not look crazy? PK plus the log of bicarb over carbonic acid, right? And do we actually know what carbonic acid is on our paper? We don't, we can't measure that because it's such a fast exchange when we look at the chemistry of it. So here's the thing, we have a constant and that's the pH of 6.1, that is our constant for a human, right? If you've taken chemistry before, you know that P pKs can be different, uh, but for a human are 6.1. So when we're doing this, we do 6.1 plus the log of bicarb over carbonic acid. Well, we can't measure carbonic acid. We can't just draw a blood sample and be like, hey, this is their carbonic acid. No, because it's such a fast reaction, we can't catch carbonic acid. But what we can do is, hey, we know that there is a carbonic acid in this patient's bloodstream and it's PaCO2. So what we do is we sort of do a conversion factor. Don't you love this? We take the PaCO2 times 0 0.03, not 0, 0, 003, right? I can understand where you would get that. You'd be like, oh, I just went over all those other calculations where we did 0 0.003 and this one's just 0 0.03. I know. 
I know, but this one is just 0 0.03. So if I take my PaCO2 times 0 0.03, that is roughly the equivalent of the carbonic acid. So I can actually do this calculation, and we can do one together in one of the Zoom meetings. Just remind me to do this together. This looks crazy, I know, but it's actually not that hard to do, and we'll do it together, right? Well, just got to remind me, and I'll try to write it down too, but when we're looking at this, ultimately what we're looking at too, and I like equations, not because the math involved, right? That's not the part that I enjoy. I like the math part of it because, or the equation part of this, because it explains how pH is figured out. Because when you're looking at this, you're comparing the ratio of bicarb to acid, right? CO2 times 0 0.03, all right. So when we're looking at this, we're looking at the ratio of acid, a base, sorry, a bases and acid. So we have bicarb, which is a base, and CO2, which is an acid. So we're looking at what determines our pH is the ratio ultimately of base and acids in our bloodstream, right? And that's what we talked about on one of the opening screens there is that, hey, when we're looking at pH, we have that beaker. Uh, we either have a lot of bicarb that's causing it to be the pH to be off, or we have no bicarb that's causing the pH off. We have a lot of acid, or we don't have enough acid that's causing the pH to be off. So this equation is actually looking at, hey, what makes up pH? Well, pH is the ratio of bicarb or a base to acids in your in your system. So yes, I do want you to memorize this equation. Is it something you'll be using every day? Probably not. But what I want you to do is, in my hope, is that maybe you do have it on like a little card that's in your badge holder, right? That's part of all your equations Derek thought was important. But what I hope to you to remember is be like, you see a blood gas down the road and you see this sort of situation that's going up here like what we see at the top of the screen. You see that situation and you said, oh, there was something I could do about that, right? And then you're like, oh yeah, Derek said to calculate a pH, you just got to do this equation. So you look at your little card and there's the equation. So you know that, hey, there's something I can do to fix this problem, to figure out why this looks so funky, right? So that would be my hope is you remember the tool to use in the situation. So the tool to use in the situation when you have a weird looking blood gas values where you have a normal pH and everything else looks abnormal, though the, your tool to help you understand if this is a lab error or not is going to be the Henderson-Hasselbach tool, the Henderson-Hasselbach equation. Okay, so that was what we were talking about there. And that was part of your chemical buffer system, right? The bicarb and carbonic acid that's naturally floating uh, around in your bloodstream right now. The second most powerful um, compensator for acid and bases is going to be your respiratory system. So this acts within minutes. So it's not immediate like your chemical buffer system. This is going to be, hey, wait a couple minutes. And then if the chemical buffer system doesn't do its thing, that's when the respiratory system kicks in, right? So this is when you start breathing heavy when you're on a treadmill or doing wind sprints or, you know, doing my Zumba class, right? One of those things, it's going to cause your respiratory system to ultimately be like, okay, you've created a lactic acidosis and your chemical buffer is not kicking in. So I'm going to kick in. That's where you start breathing fast and deep. So this is your second line of defense af uh, after the chemical buffer system. So what, what do you do? How does it work? So this works by either increasing or decreasing your breathing depth or rate. So remember, if someone is acidotic, odds are they have a lot of CO2 in their bloodstream, okay? Their pH is low, right? That's the definition of acidosis, less than 7.35. So what does the respiratory system do? How is it going to compensate? How is it going to help me return to homeostasis? Well, the respiratory system will increase in this situation how deep and fast you breathe right? This is where you're going to actually hyperventilate. Remember, hyperventilation implies that the CO2 level is decreasing, right? 
So you're going to purposely, your brain stem is going to get the signal from your bloodstream. Hey, you, you have a lot of acid going on. So your brain stem is going to get the signal from your bloodstream. Hey, breathe fast, breathe deep. So you can get rid of CO2 to restore homeostasis. So this is what you'll do. You'll breathe fast and deep to blow off CO2. And then the idea there is you'll hopefully get rid of the CO2, which is a carbonic acid. And therefore your pH should start to go back to normal, right? To be compensated for this acidosis you put your body in. So that's where it would increasing the rate in the depth of breathing. Well, what happens if uh, my body is in a severe metabolic alkalosis? Oh, heavens. What would happen? So let's just say your patient was given too much bicarb in their IV, right? I'm just making up a scenario here. Uh, given too much bicarb in their IV and their whole body is in, a, in an alkalosis. So if CO2 is an acid, your body's natural compensatory mechanism is actually going to try to hold on to that CO2, to hold on to that acid to buffer how basic your body is. So your breathing rate and depth will decrease. I'm going to now breathe at a respiratory rate of 5 and a tidal volume of 200 right something incredibly low to help retain co2 in this situation so that way my ph would start to go down to a normal level so your respiratory system can compensate for both an alkalosis and an acidosis the most powerful system would be your renal okay so the renal is going to be your most powerful one here um, it, it is the most effective one, right? Most effective acid-based monitor and regulator. Uh, this assumes that your kidneys are functioning well or the patient's kidneys are functioning well. Uh, hopefully yours are functioning well too. Um, but as long as your patient's kidneys are functioning well, this is one that you want to kick in, all right? So this can take several hours to days before the renal system really kicks in to correct this pH balance. So it's not immediate, but when it does kick in, it really helps out. And it's sort of a twofold situation. It can help your body excrete uh, what's, what's the dominant thing going on. So let's say your body was acidic, right? So let's say your blood is acidic. The kidneys can retain bicarb in the bloodstream. So instead of peeing it out, instead of getting rid of bicarb, your kidneys can actually retain bicarb and at the same time kick out hydrogen ions into the urine. So this means their urine pH actually goes down. So this is one of the reasons why in critical care medicine we actually look at the urine pH. It's not because it makes us look smart, but it's because it can actually tell us if the kidneys are compensating for their acidosis. If the urine pH gets more acidic, then that's a sign that they're retaining bicarb and they're kicking out hydrogen ions. Their kidneys are working. That's good. You want their patient's kidneys to work because that also means they're going to help buffer the patient's acid overall and therefore make your job of keeping this patient alive a lot easier. <laughs> right? Okay, hopefully you sort of get that. So the kidney's action is twofold. It's going to go hold on to what is good and get rid of what is bad, right? So in the case of an acidosis, it's going to go hold on to the base, which is the good thing to help buffer, and it's going to get rid of what's bad, which in this case is the excessive hydrogen ions, right? So this should remove excess hydrogen ions and therefore get their pH back up to a normal level. But what if they're basic? What if their blood is alkaline, right? So the kidneys, they'll do the exact opposite. They're going to hold on to hydrogen ions. The urine pH will then be higher. It'll be alkalotic. And their body's going to excrete more bicarb, right? Their, their pH of the urine is going to be alkalotic. That's a sign their kidneys are working to help compensate for this, right? And we can even give the patient um, a, a drug called Diamox, and it's a diuretic, and that can actually help them hold on to uh, even more hydrogen ions and excrete even more bicarb. So let's say we have a patient that has a pH of 7.60, severe alkalosis, and this has actually happened in my practice with a patient where we had a patient severe alkalosis and they're going into a lot of neural dysfunction 
So the doc's like, hey, what are your thoughts? And I'm like, well, the kidneys, we can give them this drug called Diamox, and you guys can look it up. It's a diuretic, um, and it will actually help them excrete bicarb and therefore lower how basic their blood is. In other words, put them back to a more acidic or a more normal, I should say, pH, right? So they elected not to do that with this case because of the kidney function of this patient. Uh, would have altered, uh, this was an organ donation patient, right? So it's a whole different scenario. You can ask me about that later. But these are all things that you guys will be looking at here, right? And I'm giving you real life examples of when you're going to be using this information. So hopefully you appreciate that a little bit. Uh, but this is sort of how the renal function system works. It does two things at once, right? It, it, it does two things at once, and that's what makes it the most effective of the acid base uh, group there. By doing two things at once, once it does kick in, it's really going to work. Okay, so now we're getting to the end here. So the body has uh, buffering systems that work to regulate the pH, hopefully between 7.35 and 7.45. Below 7.35, and this is where we start talking about how to name a blood gas. So a pH lower than 7.35 is considered acidic, or we can consider it um, an acid, or this is an acidosis, which is what you'll you'll see, right? These are all synonyms for the same thing. A pH that's above 7.45 is considered an alkalosis, um, or they're alkalotic, or their pH is basic. Usually we call it an alkalosis, right? So if we have acute changes in their carbonic acid, um, the carbonic acid plays a much more powerful role in changing the pH than bicarb. Why? And hopefully you remember this. Remember with the Henderson-Hasselbach, we were looking at the ratio of base to acids, right? Remember that was the the henderson hasselbach equation ultimately, is we're looking at the ratio of base to acids. So acute changes in carbonic acid, which is the one down here, acute changes in bicarb, play a much more powerful role in the patient's pH than the bicarb. So in the carbonic acid, cha changes their pH way more than the bicarb will than the base will. So acid has much more effect up pH changes than the base. Why? Hopefully you remember this from uh, your chemistry class. When we're looking at this, this is usually a ratio of 20 to 1, right? And this can be thrown off because of the patient's acid-base balance. So if we have too much acid or too little base, too much base, too little acid, remember we were talking about, hey, we got this beaker and it's 7.0 and this beaker over here, and it's 7.5, right? So this is what we were talking about before. I normally have a 20 to 1 ratio, so let's just do this one, right? And then 7.4, all right? It's supposed to be a decimal. 7.4, and this would be a ratio of 20 to 1, okay? Of bicarb to acid, okay? So base, I'll put a B for base and then an A for acid. So that's a normal ratio. That's where we have a pH of 7.4 for our patient. Okay, so over here we have a pH of 7.0. Okay, so that means something is thrown off here. So what if I had a ratio here of still 20 of bicarb, but now I have two of acid. So I have twice the amount of acid, and I have not changed my bicarb at all. My bicarb is still 20. You see how that can have a huge change. So if I were to take this solution, and if I wanted this solution to go back to a pH of 7.4, I would have to add an extra 20 of bicarb, so then it would be 40 to 2, and then that would send it back to a normal 7.40. So we, we this is our normal homeostasis ratio is that 20 to 1. So when we're looking at this beaker over here, the 7.0 beaker, in this situation, our body added more acid. This could be a lactic acidosis, like you running up and down stairs really fast, right? So that would be your body adding an acid. Or the 7.0, remember, I was 
teaching you to think critically. What if we had um, one, but now we had uh, 40? <laughs> oh, heavens. Uh-oh, would this work out? This would not work out because this would be basic. Uh-oh, what about this situation? If I had a bicarb of 10 and an acid of one. So in this situation, I would still be acidic. I could still have a pH of 7.0, let's just say. So in this situation, I have a pH of 7.0, but instead of it being my body creating an acid like we had up here, in this situation, my body got rid of a base. I have only a base of 10 instead of a base of 20. And so because there's less base in the solution, my pH decreased. Do you guys see that? So hopefully that sort of helps you make sense when we were looking at that before, is we need this ratio of 20 to 1. So it can be due to imbalances, whether it's too little base or too much acid, or in the case of the pH of 7.5, um, too much base and too little acid, or um, the patient's getting rid of a lot of acid with vomiting, or the patient is, has the addition of a base, like someone gave them a bicarb transfusion, right? Something like that could be going on. So in acidosis, in general, if we do see a patient in acidosis, there are general two things that are sort of at fault, okay, in general. So it's usually a respiratory problem. So this is where we get to start assigning blame. Hopefully you are excited about assigning blame. I think it's fun. <laughs> so either it's the result of a respiratory problem, like we're not breathing deep, we're not breathing fast, the respiratory system is not compensating, right? So that means their CO2 level in their bloodstream is high, right? So as, a, or it could be something where their bicarb, right, could be the issue here. So in this case, there'd be too little a bicarb, like what we've seen down here. Right, if our kidneys are peeing off too much, our kidneys are eliminating too much bicarb, then our patient can go into an acidosis. Right, we're we're decreasing this 20 to 1 to now a 10 to 1 ratio. So we need to assign blame when we're looking at a blood gas. We'll see the pH is off, but in both of these situations, 7.0, 7.0. How do we know which problem to fix? We know their pH is off. How do we know which problem to fix? And that's why we have to look at who caused the pH to go off. Is it the bicarb that caused the pH to change? Or is it the acid, right? The CO2 that caused the pH to change. If the CO2 is what caused the pH to change, then we need to help them ventilate more effectively. If it's the bicarb that caused the pH to change, then we need to take corrective action for the bicarb change, right? So we need to start assigning what caused their acidosis. Is it a respiratory acidosis or a metabolic, which is the bicarb, metabolic acidosis? And an alkalosis, same thing. It could be either a respiratory problem where a patient seen a ghost and they blew off a lot of CO2, right? <laughs> right? Or it could be the results of a metabolic problem, right? Where their body is producing too much bicarb, right? That's something that their body is doing. So when we're looking at this, this could be um, what is causing it. So we can have a metabolic acidosis, right? Too much bicarb or respiratory acid, alkal sorry, a metabolic alkalosis where there's too much bicarb or metabolic alkalosis where there's too little CO2, right? And then, hey, guess what? Just because this is such a fun, complex subject, let me add something more to this. Sometimes both of them can be at fault. <laughs> Boo. All right. So this is where we have a combination problem where here, let's give an example. I have a pH of 7.0. So that's acidic. So I'm just going to put a little A here for acidic. And I have a CO2 level of, let's just say 100. Super high CO2. I'm going to say that's acidic. And you'd be like, wait, this is a respiratory problem because look at how high the CO2 level is. The CO2 level is causing the pH to be 7.0. I would say so far it looks like that. But then I tell you their bicarb level is 5, which is also acidic, right? Very, very low because normal bicarb is 22 to 26 mil equivalents per liter. So when we're looking at this, both the respiratory system and the metabolic system are combining 
to cause the pH to be at a 7.0. So this is called a mixed acidosis in this case, right? So if both of these are going that same direction, this is called a combination, right? This is a mixed acidosis or a combined acidosis when we look at it. So all of these can happen. The last person that I personally intubated had a combined acidosis or a mixed acidosis, right? So both their renals were failing because they were in a anoxic, they were in hypoxic failure, as well as they weren't breathing effectively. That's why their CO2 level was high. So both of those things were failing, which caused their pH to be super low. Their pH was lower than 7.25. And so that's when we made the decision to intubate, right? So hopefully you sort of see that because of these things, we need to start labeling it. So when I was charting this blood gas, I was charting, hey, it was a mixed acidosis, right? So both the acid was mixed from the respiratory and from the metabolic system. All right, so make sure you know your ABG normal values, okay? So arterial blood gas, 7.35 to 7.45. CO2 is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. Bicarb is 22 to 26 milliequivalents per liter. This would be your metabolic, your CO2 is going to be respiratory. So one of the things that I do um, when I would look at these things and what I did as a student is I would look at, I would write this in the top quarter of my paper in my notes and it'd be 7.45. Anything greater than that is basic. 7.35. Anything less than that is acidic. So I'm creating my own little key, right? A CO2 of 35 to 45 is normal millimeters of mercury. So a CO2 greater than 45 is actually acidic, right? Because that's an acid, right? CO2 is an acid. So bigger number here means more acid. Uh, CO2 less than 35 is basic, right? I'm creating my own key so I sort of know which direction things are going. My bicarb is 22 to 26. Bicarb is a base. So more bicarb equals more base. So anything greater than 26 is considered basic and then anything less than 22 is considered acidic. So this is exactly how I did it on my paper when I was in school. Uh, I would just write the normals. Make sure you remember the units. <laughs> pH doesn't have a unit, but uh, millimeters of mercury, milliequivalents per liter for bicarb. Uh, make sure that you know which direction each of these goes. So if I say, hey, their CO2 is 80, you would say that's an acidosis. Or I, I say their bicarb is 50, you would say that's an alkalosis, right? So you do need to know which direction is acidic, which direction is basic in this whole thing. So make sure you got your normals down. Uh, your book may say 22 to 28. Like I said, I want you to do 22 to 26. That's what you will be tested on ultimately when it comes down to it uh, in the future. So this is where we get to have a little bit of fun. So our body tries hard to compensate for acid-base balances. We've already talked about this. The idea is to get to homeostasis. This goes back to pretty much our first screen. So our body is trying to bring our pH back to normal. So when we are looking at labeling a blood gas, not only are we labeling who caused the pH to be off, right? Respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis. Who caused the pH to be off? So not only are we labeling that, but we also want to comment at what stage of compensation is this patient at? So in other words, did this just happen and this is an acute situation and the patient has pretty much uncompensated? They have not done anything to correct their pH yet. So what do I mean by that? Here, let's do an example. So I have a pH of 7.0. I'm just going to keep that pH and a CO2 level of 60. Oh, heavens. And a bicarb level of 24. Okay. So this is where you make sure you do your normals. 7.35 to 7.45. Um, 35 to 45, and then 22 to 26. Uh, less than 7.35 is acidic, 
and then basic, and then less than 35 is basic, greater than 45 is acidic, uh, 22, less than 22 is acidic, and greater than 26 is basic. Okay, so I've done exactly what I used to do, right? What I recommend you do anyway. So now I'm looking at this. Okay, so I have a pH of 7.0, pH CO2, and then I'll just put B for bicarb. So when we're looking at this patient, they have a pH that's acutely, that's, that's severely low, and their CO2 is really, really high. So this is a respiratory, right? Because this CO2 is the respiratory system. Respiratory acidosis, right? Okay, so I have a patient that's a respiratory acidosis, but how compensated for this acidosis are they? Well, did their bicarb, is that abnormal at all? Right, a normal bicarb up here is 22 to 26, and so this person's bicarb is normal. So that means whatever happened here to cause the CO2 level to be up and the pH to be down is uncompensated. In other words, it did not change. No change. Uh, it's supposed to be a change. <laughs> it did not change the bicarb. It's uncompensated. So this would be considered an acute respiratory acidosis. Once again, because the bicarb did not change, right, the bicarb's normal, this would be an uncompensated or acute respiratory acidosis. Hopefully that makes sense, right? We have one of them that's off that caused the pH to change and the other one's normal. So one of these is off, like in this situation, the CO2 is way off. The other one, the bicarb is normal. So if only one of them is off and the other one's normal, then that's an acute situation. We The kidneys have not recognized this yet. Okay, partially compensated. Okay, this means your body has started to account for this situation. So what does that mean? Partially compensated. So uh, I have a pH, and let's just do a blood gas down here, a pH of 7.0. Three, a CO2 of 60. This patient is still not looking great. And let's just say I have a bicarb of 30. Okay, so what's happening here? If I have a pH of 7.3, I still have an acidosis. I'm just going to write the letter A next to it because I know we have an acidosis of some sort. The CO2 of 60 is an acidosis, right? And then a bicarb of 30 is actually basic. Okay, so one of these is acidic, where the CO2 is acidic, the bicarb is basic. So these two are trying to compensate for each other, right? Oh, you're acidic, I'm going to try to be basic, or you're basic, I'm going to try to be acidic. So we see the kidneys here kicking in to compensate for the high CO2 levels. So because the pH is still off, because the pH is still abnormal, right? We haven't reached a normal pH yet. This is going to con be considered a partially compensated. So this is going to be a partially compensated respiratory acidosis. Why is it a respiratory acidosis? Because the CO2 level is acidic and the pH is acidic. So this is a respiratory acidosis. And we do have the kidneys kicking in because that level is opposite, right? And it's partially compensated. So this is what's called a partially compensated acidosis, right? Or it could work the same in alkalosis. And we'll do some more examples later on. So this would be a partially compensated acidosis, respiratory acidosis. All right, what's the third one down here? It says chronic, okay. So imagine, if you will, someone that has emphysema, someone that has chronically high CO2 levels. So here, let me do this. I have a patient whose pH is 7.37, okay? A CO2 of 60, I'm just gonna keep using that. <laughs> and a bicarb of 31. Okay, so now this patient, when I look at the pH, usually I would go through these and just label them one at a time. So I'm looking at the pH. The pH is normal, right? Normal 7.35 to 7.45. So it's normal, but in this situation, it leans towards what? 
the acidic side. So I put a sub A next to it, even though it's normal. Um, normal, the CO2 is not normal, that's acidic, so I'm going to label it that way. All right, and then the bicarb is 31, which is basic, so I'm going to label it that way. Okay, so since I have a normal pH, this is a chronic compensation. In other words, the bicarb and the lungs, right, the, the bicarb and the CO2 have compensated for each other to the way that we now have a normal range pH. So this patient chronically has a high CO2 level, and because of their chronic high CO2 level, they have a chronically high bicarb level to compensate to the point where they now have a normal pH. So this would be a chronic, still because this leans towards the acidic side and so does the CO2, this would be a chronic respiratory acidosis or a compensated respiratory acidosis. Those are synonyms, right? A chronic or compensated synonyms, right? So you'll see it both ways. Not something I created, that's just something that's out there. So this would be a chronic or compensated respiratory acidosis. So this would be sort of a blood gas that you could see from someone that, have, that has emphysema, right? So here you see the range. So acute, partially compensated in a chronic, right? Or complete compensation. So if it's acute, you're looking at the CO2 and the bicarb in both in all three of these situations. You're looking at the CO2 and the bicarb. If only one of them is outside of normal limits, you know this is an acute blood gas. You know it's an acute whatever, right? If both of these are outside of their limits and they go the opposite directions and the pH is not normal, then it's a partially compensated. If both of these, the CO2 and the bicarb, are outside of normal limits and the pH is within normal limits, you know it's a chronic problem. Hopefully that makes sense. You can always rewind that. Watch it again. We will go over it again. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about naming it. We've already talked a little bit about naming it. So this is where we talk about naming a blood gas. So here's my recommendations for success. I want you to write out the normal ranges like what we did on the previous screen, where we do uh, 7.35 to 7.45, right? And then I do acidic and basic. Then I want you to do CO2, right? Which way the which way goes acid, which way it goes basic, right? So 35 to 45 for CO2, and then anything less than 35 is basic, right? They're hyperventilating. Anything greater than 45 is acidic, they're building up CO2. And then bicarb, 22 to 26. Anything less than 22 is acidic, right? Because bicarb is a base. And then anything greater than 26 would be basic, right? Because it's a high value for a base. All right, so write out your normal ranges. Write out which way goes acid, which way goes basic. These are my keys to success, guys. I'm trying to help you out here. Um, when we do a blood gas, we're going to name it, and that's what I was talking about in that previous screen, like a respiratory acidosis, right? Uh, so we're gonna have give it a first name, middle name, and a last name, right? So first thing that we're gonna look at here is the pH. So let's do an example, all right? I'm gonna give a 7.0. 60, 24. Okay, so there's my example. So the pH is 7.0, pH, CO2, and then bicarb. I'll put a B for bicarb. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna look at is look at the pH. Where is the pH going? If the pH is less than 7.35, it's in acidosis, right? If it's greater than 7.45, it's in alkalosis. So when I'm looking at naming this blood gas down here, and I ask you, hey, name this blood gas for me, which I guarantee you will have to do this, all right? Uh, the first thing I'm gonna do is look at the pH and say, hey, this pH is acidic, right? So I know that I have an acidosis. All right, that's one of the names. Overall, I have an acidosis going on. So before I move any further, 
I'm going to write that down so that way I don't get it mixed up later on. Okay, like I said, these are uh, order of operations to give you the most amount of success. Okay, so I know I have an acidosis of some sort going on. Okay, so that's their last name, right? This is the last name of this person. Uh, you know, who and who, acidosis, right? Now that I have a last name, I want to know their first name. So I'll look at the pH again. If the pH is normal, then we know this is a compensated blood gas. Remember, we were talking about that. Uh, but if it's outside the range, then we know it's in that uncompensated category. Remember, there's two sub areas in the uncompensated category. It's either partially compensated or acute, right? So these are the two subcategories. Remember, partial compensation or acute. Okay, those are the two subcategories. Okay, so in this situation down here, my example 7.0, this is either partially compensated or acute. Ah, I don't know yet. Okay, but let's look at the rest of the gas. I have a CO2 of 60, which is acidic, so I'm going to write a little A next to it, and a bicarb of 24, which is normal. Okay. So I put the N there for normal. So when I'm looking at this, is this partially compensated or acute? Well, I'm looking at the CO2 and the bicarb, right? These are the two that I'm looking at right now. CO2 and bicarb. Is one of these normal and the other one not? That is true of this case. So this is A, acute. So the first name is going to be acute. So this is an acute acidosis of some sort. Okay, but remember this is acute because one between the CO2 and the bicarb, one of them is normal, the other one is not. What if the situation was over here, 7.0, and then I had a CO2 of 60 and a bicarb of 35, right? 35. <laughs> Just ignore that. So when we're looking at this, uh, this would be a partially compensated because both of these were off and they're going in opposite directions. So one was basic, one's acidic, right? That would be partially compensated, but we don't have that in this case. In this case, one of them is normal, one of them is not. So that is an acute situation. Bicarb is unaware currently of the situation that's going on over here with the lungs. So over here, now I need to assign the middle name, right? The middle name is going to give us more information, right? So this is going to see who's to blame for this acute acidosis. So who's to blame? So what I used to like to do is like, hey, I have an acidosis here. Who goes along? Which one of these has an A? Well, this one has an N, so it's not the metabolic, right? So it's the respiratory. So remember the A's go with the A's, right? So this, or B's goes with B's, right? So this would be an acute respiratory acidosis, right? And that's how you would label this blood gas. This is an acute respiratory acidosis the patient has, and that's why we're gonna put them on a breathing machine to help them breathe more effectively. Right, so this the a lot of steps here, right? But this is just us starting with this. I promise you will get faster with this. Um, and then I have a worksheet I'll try to load up uh, on Blackboard for you guys as well, so you can practice this or we can practice it over uh, meetings as well. So try to look at these um, blood gases, try to look at normal. Um, labeling uh, acidic, basic, or normal, and then doing examples of, a, uh, of an acute, uh, partially compensated, and of complete uh, chronic or compensated gas. So hopefully, take some time, go through it slowly. Uh, I promise, we'll work this together.